If there's one thing I like fixing above all others, it's a rubber key Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And look, here's a nice broken one. Another one from Paul Universal Retro Boss's eBay haul, sent over for me to fix. Works, but dodgy startup. I wonder what that means. The case is in excellent condition, with hardly a mark on the plastic. According to the post-it note, the faceplate and keyboard are new. I suspect this means the keyboard membrane is new. This rubber keyboard has some yellowing and doesn't look so new to me. Anyway, I won't hang about. This is a quick fix episode. Let's get inside and see what's what. Ah yes, new membrane. And issue three. And it looks like very little previous work has been done in here. Always a good start. It's amazing how often the CPU failed in these back in the day. I know it's always the RAM, but it's also always the CPU. I've even had a couple fail in my own machines. There are no other signs of work in here, which is a relief considering the last spec we saw on this channel. Well, that's an assortment of capacitors. I would guess these ones are the originals, and these four have been replaced at some point, probably a long time ago. It's funny, people always say you should change the capacitors in 16 and 48k spectrums, and for good reason too. They're 40 years old and well past their sell-by date, even if they hadn't been baked inside these hot little computers. But having fixed a fair few of these now, I'm yet to see one where the capacitors have actually failed enough to cause a problem. Too obvious a setup? Okay, forget I said all that and I'll distract you with this unusually branded CPU. Mostec. A Mostec Z80 from Ireland. This one's a first for me. Right, heatsink out of the way. I've run through all the usual resistance tests off camera. Link to a very useful video explaining these can be found in the description. One thing that did get flagged up as unusual was the resistance measured on the input side of this voltage regulator. I compared it to a couple of other boards and it was not the same. This might be a red herring though. Okay, before I plug this in, I'm going to go all belt and braces. All the RAM chips are original, so I don't want to risk some missing voltages not going to the lower RAM and popping a chip. First up, out comes the voltage regulator. I can drop another in here and see if the resistance changes. And I can tell you, I can't show you as the footage didn't get recorded, oops, that the resistance remained the same. The original regulator is now back in the board and I'm taking out the transistors at TR4 and TR5. These are the worst offenders. You can test them in circuit, but some faults won't show that way. So I find it's quicker just to take them out and test them in a component tester and have done with it. Hard to see, but the upshot here is both transistors have passed their tests. Fine. So I'm now at the point I can switch it on without too much risk. And here we go. Wait, what, nothing? Oh, it's not composite. <laughs> ah, good reason for that. I've connected the Spectrum to my TV composite input and the RF modulator hasn't been modded for composite output yet. Okay, next job is a quick comp mod. Signal and voltage leads removed and fold it over the edge of the can. Resistor inside the modulator removed from the back of the socket. Hmm, that cap is too tall. It could work, but I have the full capacitor replacement kit here from Retrolium, which includes the shorter 100 microfarad cap, which will fit better. Positive lead in the board, negative lead into the modulator. Right, let's see what the picture looks like. 
Well, that's not a screen that fills me with joy. The fact the border is black implies the CPU is not executing code. There could be any number of reasons for this though. There's little point in speculating at this point. I'll usually run through the obvious stuff first in this situation. And I start by popping the CPU and the ULA out and testing those in working machines. Both pass that test. Without the CPU running, I can't use the diagnostic cart or ROM. So the next thing to do is check the voltages around the board, starting with the regulator. I switched on the computer and probed first the incoming leg which had a nice solid 9 volts. Then I switched to the output leg which had the expected 5 volts. At this moment I slipped and momentarily shorted the 5 volt output to ground, which resulted in this. Not looking at the screen I didn't even notice right away and carried on checking voltages on the RAM until... Oh. A minute ago, when you nearly fried the voltage regulator, you clumsy oaf. That is odd. So is your face. But what do you think it is? That smells of capacitor. I tend to agree, but mostly because I'm from the future. By the way, while I'm here, watch out for jabbing yourself in the thumb with the soldering iron. I pondered for a while and then decided it was best just to change the caps. At least then I'd be able to eliminate them. On with the recap. Hold off on the fast forward button for a moment. Something happened on the first leg I tried to desolder and it's a valuable lesson. The nozzle on these desoldering tools can be a little rough if you're heavy handed. And in the normal course of using my one, I'm usually very careful not to put too much pressure onto the board. The capacitor legs are all bent over on this board and I have to admit I tried to straighten the leg with the nozzle of the gun, which didn't go well. At first glance it looks to the naked eye like I might have scraped a trace and possibly broken it. What I should have done is add fresh solder to the joint with my iron and bend the leg straight with the end of that. It's another good reason to use a flat chisel tip, makes this pretty easy. Although you should still take care, it's still easy to slip and you could damage something or even worse, jab yourself in the thumb with a hot bit of metal. That doesn't sound like fun at all. I forgot to check the orientation of this cap, so a quick check with the multimeter decides where the positive end is. For the record, I believe the silkscreen markings on this issue 3 board are all correct. That's the first four caps installed. I wonder if that made any difference. Well it did. The border is now white. That means the CPU is running. That's good. These two caps at C47 and C27 are often the culprits when caps dry out because of the excessive heat inside a spectrum. I'm curious to see if these two are the cause. So I decide to check after each pair of caps to see if the fault changes. Well, it changed. It's changed into not a fault. Superb. I have the rest of the caps still to fit. There's very little that can go wrong at this point. Smooth sailing, I fully expect. Yeah. 
<laughs> Serves you right. Should have listened to me. And here's a small problem that catches many people out. The ripply texture on the bottom of the ZX Spectrum motherboard is extra solder that was added to the ground plane at the factory and not some crazy corrosion, which is what I thought when I first saw it. This capacitor leg is soldered into that ground plane and my tip is struggling to melt the solder through to the other side. The way I found easiest to get the cap out, which is the first part of the problem, is to add some extra solder to the top side of the joint. Heat that and then pull the leg out while it's still molten. The next part of the problem is to clear the hole. Fortunately, my desolder gun makes light work of that with no leg in the way. But if you're trying this at home and are struggling to clear that hole with a hand desolder pump, then I would suggest flowing the solder with your iron and then poking the leg of the new cap into the hole. It works just as well. That's all of them. Another test to make sure I didn't break anything. The screen looks kinda okay on camera, but in real life, it's a little dark. That's another easy fix with changing transistors at TR1 and 2 next to the modulator. The pack contains the correct BC549C parts supplied in the kit. I should point out they should be installed the opposite way round to the silkscreen footprint. Right, I feel confident this is fully working and it's lovely I didn't need to replace any of the chips. Leaving everything looking like it was just manufactured is a big bonus. I know that fitting sockets when replacing a faulty RAM IC is a good thing, but it really does look ugly. I grabbed my CRT for testing. The picture the Spectrum produces on a large LCD TV is unpleasant. And it's been a good few decades at least since I saw in person a Spectrum display on a tube. Looks a bit crap, but then it always did. So all is right in the world. I better test the memory. Fast, perfect. The last thing to check is the trace I scraped with the desolder gun. Yep, that's still intact. You can see how easy it is to damage a delicate board though. Only the keyboard and load in a game to test and I can send this one back to Paul. I'm going for Jetpack this time. Loaded from an Android phone running the Play ZX app, which is excellent by the way. Superb, all working. Sound, keyboard, everything. It's actually nice to finally find a Spectrum that has properly bad capacitors. If you enjoyed this video and want to see a more extreme repair of a ZX Spectrum, why not click on the video on the left? It's all about the most broken Spectrum ever and how I may or may not have brought it back to life. I know many of you have already switched off by this point, 
But for those that are struggling to find the stop button, could I trouble you for a click on the subscribe button? And if you're really feeling adventurous or left out because you're already a subscriber to my little channel, how about activating that handy notification feature? YouTube has started hiding my content for some reason. Probably an Atari fan. Bye.